Hello. Uh, on behalf of uh, Banking University's English Department, as well as Banking Speech and Debate Team, I'd like to welcome you all to the public debate that we have featuring uh, C. Shepherd Founder Captain Paul Watson. Uh, we think it's going to be an incredible event. The topic of the debate is that the law should be the preferred avenue to advance animal rights and environmental conservation. Uh, Paul Watson will be on the proposition side, which means that he will be advocating in favor of the use of the law. And he's joined by uh, All-American debater uh, Brandon Evans, who's a member of Binghamton Speech and Debate Team. And then on the opposition, we have William Shanahan, uh, who is a inter, uh, intersectional research collaborative chair of the Institute of Critical Animal Studies, and he is competing with Trevor Reddick, who is the team's president as well as a national debate scholar. And they'll be advancing an argument about why we should use the law as an avenue to continue to advance environmental conservation and uh, animal rights. We'll be doing it from more of an indigenous anarcho perspective rather than one that views reformism and works within the system. Um, and then after the debate, we will have a question and answer period in which uh, people can line up to ask questions about the debate to either of the sides. And then uh, Paul Watson will be giving them a speech about the Sea Shepherd and why it's so important in order to be able to help you know, fight the biodiversity losses that are happening around the world. And then there'll be a question and answer period. And we'll start with people who have pre who have pre-submitted the questions. And if we have time afterwards, we'll open it up to other people who have questions. All right? Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Sea Shepherd founder, Captain Paul Watson, will be giving the opening proposition speech. You know, in the past, I've uh, debated uh, politicians and lawyers, so I, based on that experience, I think that I'll have a much more passionate, formidable opposition with these two gentlemen here on the uh, It's had a rather strange situation for me to be uh, defending the position of or working within the system, since I don't really have a reputation for doing that. But in 1977, I set up the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society as a as a vehicle to uphold international conservation law. You know, we have all the laws and the rules and the regulations and the treaties we need to protect the oceans. So there, they've been there for some time. What we don't have is the political and economic motivation to uphold those treaties and rules and regulations. And so what we have in the ocean is pretty much a state of anarchy, that anybody can do whatever they want, to whatever they want, whenever they want, because all of the vested interests lie with those profit-making entities, even if those entities are operating illegally. In 1982, the United Nations passed uh, a legislation, or was called the United Nations World Charter for Nature. And in that uh, World Charter for Nature, under the section on implementation, they said that every individual organization or nation state has the right to uphold international conservation law and in Section 21E, specifically in areas beyond national jurisdiction, where Sea Shepherd operates primarily. When we operate outside the 200-mile limit, then we operate under the auspices of the UN World Charter for Nature. When we operate within the 200-mile limit, we do so in partnership with, uh, with uh, rangers or policing forces. Right now, I have two vessels that are operating in partnership with the Senegalese, uh, Ministry of Fisheries and the Coast Guard to stop poaching off of the West African coast. And for the last 14 years, we've been in partnership with the Ecuadorian uh, Federal Police and the uh, Galapagos Park Rangers to protect the Galapagos Park National uh, Marine Reserve. We've also worked with the Guatemalans uh, in this, and, the Co and the Costa Ricans in this respect. So what we do is we provide them with the means, the vessels, the equipment, in order for them to utilize their authority in order to go after after poachers. For the last uh, 10 years, we've been fighting the Japanese whaling fleet in the Southern Ocean Whale Sanctuary. It's called a whale sanctuary. You'd think that common sense would dictate you don't kill whales in a whale sanctuary. And for 10 years, the Japanese have been calling us pirates and eco-terrorists and, and outlaws. Well, fortunately, two months ago, the International Court uh, of Justice in The Hague ruled that they were illegal and vindicated us. It is the Japanese who are the eco-terrorists. And by the way, that name, which is used, uh, it's thrown around quite liberally these days, eco-terrorist, what the hell is an eco-terrorist? You know, that's BP, that's Union Carbide. Those are the eco-terrorists. When you're eco-terrorism, means you're terrorizing the Earth. So to call some, uh, anybody who's working to protect the Earth 
An eco-terrorist is just insane. In fact, conservationists are the conservatives. We're more damn conservative than any, anything you'll ever find on a Fox network because we stand for protecting natural values, maintaining the status quo of this planet. The radicals are out there trying to destroy the planet, destroy the ocean, cutting down the trees. These are the raving lunatic radicals that are destroying this planet. But they manipulated the language so that they call us the extremists, when in fact they're the extremists. It's all very, very Orwellian. Up in Canada, we have to deal with a thing called the Seal Protection Act. Under the Seal Protection Act, it's illegal to protect seals. In fact, it's illegal to even witness a seal being killed. If you see a seal being killed, you've just broken the law. So we actually took them to court on that, and uh, our, our case was based on the uh, Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms that said that Canada cannot restrict the movement of a Canadian within the Canadian uh, territory. And uh, the judge agreed with us. But we found out something about the Canadian government that we didn't know before. She said, yes, that's true, it is a violation of your, of your rights, it's a violation of your freedom, but under the notwithstanding clause of the Canadian, uh, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the Canadian government has the right to violate that. In other words, in Canada, you have free speech until you speak. You have free, uh, freedom of expression until you express yourself. So basically, it's a dictatorship, but it's under the guise of freedom, which is pretty much what we have all over the world, is that governments, as we know them, are no longer governments of the people. In fact, I think Princeton University just ruled two weeks ago or less than a month ago that this is no longer a democracy, that this is an ugly army, and it's run by oil companies. Government for the oil companies, by the oil companies, of the oil companies. People are really not considered of much value. And therefore, what we have is governments in Canada and in Australia and other places where it's the corporations that dictate what the policies will be. You've seen this recently with Australia, where the Prime Minister of Australia, only three weeks ago, described environmentalists as agents of Satan, and which is pretty bizarre. He never mentioned anything about all that crap before he was elected. And then up in Canada, you have a Prime Minister who thinks that dinosaurs went extinct because they couldn't get on Noah's Ark. I mean, these are the idiots who are running the planet these days. And that's where that doesn't pose very, very well to the future. So, what we have decided over the years is why do we work in the context of international law. And it's simple, for survival. Because if you step over a certain line, they will take you up. And in this country, we're seeing this all over already. We have the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, which now makes it a crime, in fact, an act of terrorism, to photograph a farm or a slaughterhouse. I mean, what kind of country is this where you can't take a picture of a cow? You know, that's pretty bizarre. But anyway, this is what we have to deal with. I was speaking a few years ago, uh, I was invited to speak to FBI Academy. And uh, at that talk, uh, one of the FBI agents said, well, you know, Sea Shepherd's walking a pretty damn fine line when it comes to the law. And I said, yeah, well, who cares how fine it is as long as you don't cross the line? There's not a damn thing you can do about this, is there? And they had to agree. And then they said, well, you know, people who've gone to work with volunteers for Sea Shepherd have gone on to become eco-terrorists, you know, like they actually did something. And uh, I said, so that's not my fault. I can't help what people do after they leave the organization or a volunteer organization. And uh, one of them said, well, you train them, therefore you're responsible for it. And I said, really? Well, I've got three names for you. Timothy McVeigh, Lee Harvey Oswald, and Osama Bin Laden. You train them, you're responsible for it. <laughs> so this is uh, you know, the dilemma that we live in a world where it's the governments that are really protecting the group. And therefore, for citizens to stand up, you have to do so in a very strategic way. And that's the reason that we work and try to work in the law and make the law work for us, because that leaves us, you know, untouchable. I've not been convicted of a crime in 40 years, although they've tried dearly. And yes, I've been to jail a few times, but before being convicted, but you know, if you haven't been to jail, can you really be trusted? <laughs> All the great people in history, from Mandela to Martin Luther King, have spent their time in jail. And it's just sort of the dues you have to pay when you're going up against the man, you know. So anyway, this is where we, we find ourselves, and we find that we've been coming very effective. This last year, we saved uh, 784 whales overall over the last few years, 6,000 whales. We're shutting down dolphin hunts and shark hunts and overfishing activities all the time. We seized a Russian uh, trawler off the coast of Senegal, forced Putin to pony up 750,000 euros, 750, euros in fines. 
uh, you know, we're getting things done. And we're getting things done by working in this partnership with, uh, with those entities that have the power to enforce and uphold, uphold the law. So I think it's a strategic uh, point of view that we've uh, adopted. And, uh, and it's been working for us ever since. And uh, what Sea Shepherd is now is a movement, a movement which is in 40 countries, and uh, it's a movement of volunteers and a movement that is making a difference overall. Thank you. certain groups that, you know, they put people out there, volunteers, to take direct action and break the law, and that ends up uh, ruining their lives for the rest of their life because they've been put in that situation. So I think if you're going to take direct action, you take it in, uh, with a strategic Okay, and so, uh, talk about strategy. Uh, so, there's so many different uh, places to go, Senegal, Ecuador, uh, Canada, all these places you talk about. How do you choose which operations that the Sea Shepherd goes on? Well, we don't choose it. It's the people who live in those countries that have the Sea Shepherd entities in those countries that make those uh, decisions. So Sea Shepherd France decides that they're going to protect sharks at the Reunion Island. They're going to go against poachers on their coast. Or we have Sea Shepherd uh, Ecuador is going to protect the Galapagos. Sea Shepherd Australia is going to protect uh, sharks in Western Australia, for example. Uh, so how does, for example, uh, stopping uh, or working for seal protection uh, help the ecosystem in Canada? Can you please explain that a little bit for me? Don't really understand the question. What I mean, I mean uh, what importance does the seal populations being like at whatever level? What importance does it have for the ecosystem that they live in? When the Europeans first arrived uh, in uh, this part of the world, there were 45 million seals on the east coast of Canada, including the walrus, which is now extinct. That population now has been driven down to a couple of million. And if you if you notice, of course, all the fish species have uh, their populations have crashed. Why? Because it's not the seals that eat fish that cause the problem, it's people that catch too many fish. But what if you want more fish, you need more seals. Why? Because there's a relationship, an interdependence between seals and other sea life. For instance, on the eastern seaboard, there's 768 species that work interdependently with each other. When you remove any of those species, you cause chaos within that ecosystem. Seals eat fish, but they eat fish which eat other fish. For instance, cod, which are targeted by capelin and herring, the seals eat them. And when you decrease the number of uh, seals, you increase the number of predatory fish, which can lead to even more of the particular species being removed. Thank you very much. Uh, so then, I guess my next question would be, if we're looking at ecosystems and how they exist overall, does individual suffering matter? And does it matter to the sea shepherds specifically? Well, sea shepherds are marine conservation society. Uh, but does individual suffering matter? Certainly it does, I think, but that's an ethical argument, our conservation one. Okay, and what relationship does conservation have to ethics? Is it not our ethical responsibility to do it? So it's not based in animal rights, is what you're saying. I think that you, what you're looking at is interdependence within any movement, uh, like within any ecosystem, all species are interdependent. Within any movement, there's interdependence, whether it be animal rights, animal welfare, conservation, environmental, ethics, social justice issues, they're all interdependent. You can't isolate one from the other. Uh, so do, do you believe your activism inspires others? I've been told it has. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of uh, inspiration has that been? Uh, what does that cause people to do? What I think that we've been able to do is to motivate people to understand that they can make a difference, that they have the power to do so. One of the early advisory board members of Sea Shepherd was Margaret Mead, who famously said, you know, don't ever expect governments or uh, corporations or organizations to really solve any problems. They never have, they never will. All social revolutions are led by passionate individuals. So what we do is encourage that passion within ind individuals because the virtues that we look for and promote are passion, imagination, and courage. I want to be 
begin with a poem repatriating ourselves by Aaron, Eric Gonsworth, an Onondaga who, Onondaga who uh, writes about the land issue that confronts indigenous people today. There is no need for you to give back to us what we already own. This is who we are in the present tense. No climate control, no tatters of cloth, no catalog bones, no beads on loan, no boxes, no labels, no ceremonial tables, no tags, no medicine bags, no hermetic sealers, no deadly diseases, no hypotheses, no educated guesses, no dioramas, no dramas, no arrays of di diaspora disconnects, no displays of personal effects. In the present tense, this is who we are, what we already own. There's no need for you to give it back to us. The reason I begin with this is because we're in the land of the Onondaga. We're in the land of the Haudenosaunee. That this, this place from land from Binghamton all the way up to Syracuse was the land given by the fact that these folks came here. They, made, they entered into treaties three or after Benjamin Franklin said the Haudenosaunee are the, uh, the light motif for American style democracy. George Washington falls it up by trying to conscript the Onondaga when they refused to fight in his war. His, his instructions were total destruction of the Haudenosaunee. This style of rabid settler colonialism and imperialism not only has to be acknowledged in settings like this, but rather it needs to be addressed in ways that allow us to do something to redress the offenses that have gone on in our name, that we are the inheritors of this genocidal legacy, and we cannot stand in places like this and argue for things at a distance. We need to acknowledge that work goes on here, that this place matters, and that the people who have lived here should not be discarded. Look, I'm a white male. I'm married to a woman, I have a kid, and I'm in a society that values whiteness and values maleness and patriarchy and re it refers to my family as, you know, normal. I am imbued with privilege as a result of who I am and the way that this society around me uh, affects me, the way that it values me or devalues me. I need to use that privilege to do something meaningful in this room, and that's what I hope to do. Another reason, we must attend to local knowledge. Vine Deloria Jr., who's a member, who was a member of the Standing Rock Lakota in North Dakota, argued that the history of Western thinking, too much caffeine, uh, the history of Western thinking for the last 800 years has been the substitution of a series of thought into a framework that has remained largely unchanged for 2,500 years. That style of, uh, of belief about the world, the notion that we can somehow have access to reality, that we have knowledge about how the world operates, and that we can predict the consequences of our actions, especially actions mediated by law or at a distance. Remember, everything that was said in that last speech was about obeying the law, being obsequious to the law, and refusing to deny the law, but most importantly, to become the world's nature police. I think this is a problem. I'm gonna develop it in a few different ways. Before I do that, I just wanna make one last argument. Look. You know, from that end day, what we used to call the Apache in southern Texas and northern Mexico, lived there for 19 generations. They have knowledge about where they live. Remember, Deloria argues that species operate differently in different places, that the wolves of New England and New York are not the same as the exact same species and how it operates in the Pacific Northwest or Canada. In other words, we need these local knowledges in order to make sense of the world, to contribute to our alternative, to the perspectives that we build, in order to make better solutions. Look, the Inupiaq lived where they live for 4,000 years. They have lived with the whales. Yes, they have killed some whales. Let's, it's, let's cross-examine them. You know, let's bring them into the fold. Let's help their knowledge become part of the decision-making basis. Okay, I have 
four basic arguments, but before I get there, remember, in order to win this debate, they have to demonstrate that the law is the preferred avenue to protect animal rights and to do conservation. The preferred route, not that it's an acceptable route, not that it's even a necessary route, but that it should be the preferred route. Ours instead will be the state should be the actor of last resort. Look, the imperial peace po police powers that the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society wants to take into itself is particularly dangerous in a lot of different ways. I, I guess I'll list four. The law doesn't work. The law is racist and genocidal. That the SSCS Imperial Nature Police Authority risks devolving into horrific acts of violence and that their brand of legal activism, founded as it is on the principles of, con of conquest and domination, will fail. Look, I don't even have to do any work on the first one. That law doesn't work? That was his speech. We have all the treaties we need. We have all the laws we need. We have all the, all the, all we need. All we got to do is enforce it. Well, you know what? Enforcement and implementation are 90% of whether or not a law is effective. And as we know, uh, most statistics made up on the spot are, well, no. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm not going to spend, I'm not going to waste time on this. They agree the law doesn't work. Thank you. Second, the law is genocidal and racist. Look, all I want to make, all, the only argument I want to make here is that the law of conquest and domination determine who the legitimate settler is in a particular area. From the United Nations all the way down to the United States, the belief is that the indigenous peoples, who used to be foreign nations, and are now reduced to the status of dependent domestic nations, wards of the state. How did this happen? The Supreme Court said in the Constitution that something was that they were foreign nations, and then suddenly, in the most recent spate of legislation, the Supreme Court says they're dependent. They're children who rely on us. Third, Imperial Nature Police. This sets a deadly precedent. Listen, at any time, a state of emergency can be, declined, can be declared and sovereign protection can be withdrawn. In other words, just look at the United States after, after the attacks of 2001. Bush declares a state of emergency. We move from torture and indefinite detention to rendition and killing, assassinating, not only our own citizens, but their children as well, because they have been stained by the work of their father. This is an obscenity. Using the law as if the law works perfectly is exactly the thing that you don't want to build a movement on. It's dangerous, and, and I, I want to read something to you real quick. This is from uh, Watson's Shepherds of the Labrador Front. Evil walks in arrogance across the ice. Arrogance fired by savage ignorance. Baby kills with hearts of stone. He's talking about people who do terrible violence to sea mammals. But by declaring them evil, by declaring them criminal, what he does is he authorizes the same thing, excuse the reductio ad Nazism, the same thing that happened in Nazi Germany. That the reason that the extermination was so effective, according to Giorgio Agamben, who's an a Italian political philosopher, is because it was carried out as a police operation. Had it had the imprimatur of the sovereign, it would have failed. It is exactly the style of activism that they're talking about that risks the destruction of the planet, and more importantly, the elimination of populations like the Inupia or the Inuit who rely on whaling for subsistence because they can't afford to eat otherwise. I'm not willing to trade a genocide in order to protect a whale. Thanks.
So uh, are you saying that we should get counsel from uh, Native Americans? No, nope, I'm saying that there should, uh, I think that it's not enough to periodically get a Native informant and say, hey, what should we do? I'm talking about a full-throated embrace of the multiple indigenous knowledges across the globe well, attributing. Now, the fact that you may or may not have talked to some Indians about this. No, no, no. We fly the flag of the Five Nations. It was given to us by the Five Nations. They approve of what we do. We fly the flag of the Aboriginal nations. They gave it to us. I have an Aboriginal passport. We fly the flag of the Maori when we're Look, down in the southern. This is exactly These are the people. What, this is what no, happened. you're not talking. I'm not talking about a couple of Indians I'm who are talking, giving I'm us. Not either. I'm, I'm talking, talking about them. official endorsement from the Mohawks, the Five Nations, well, the Maori, there were, there were and the Aboriginals. Six, and that's neither well, here nor there. If you're talking about Mohawks, something you'll argue that. But anyway, we're not talking about that. But the fact is, is that we do seek counsel, and we do get that counsel. Is that a question? I, 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 I lost the thread of it. I don't understand what you're saying. I mean, you're saying that we... You don't uh, understand what I'm saying? No. I'm saying that you deputizing yourself. I'm not deputizing Sure you did. You take on the authority of the international imperial oh. nature police, and you say that you can go across the globe, and anybody who has a vision of nature can do what they want. No. When I see a whale being killed, I'm going to intervene. When I see a seal being well, killed, I'm going to be an intervene. It's not just you. It's a movement in 40 nations that you don't have control over. Right. I do have a, uh, a council to them. The fact is, we will not sit back and watch slaughter and not intervene. And we use the law for strategically. I, I agree to... that most of the killing of these sea mammals is not acceptable. I agree with the idea of direct action. I disagree with the deputization of imperial nature police that roam the globe deciding what death is worthwhile and what is not. You're and you are in agreement with the United States government who disagrees with what we do also. Well, I'm calling for the abolition of the United States federal government, so if they agree with that, that then I think that, exactly, in other words, it's about a vision. It's about deciding how is it that you act when forced to choose what your activism will be. What, what I'm suggesting is almost the opposite of what you're Within the bounds of practicality, making yes. a difference. Yeah, direct action, collaboration, cooperation, <laughs> against hierarchy, Captain, in favor of uh, an approach to activism that is grassroots, and that repudiates the use of state, except as a last resort. Well, you know, any movement is defined by diversity, just like any other <laughs> system. And therefore, whether your approach is education, litigation, legislation, or direct action, it's all part of that into the diversity within the movement. So I certainly support all of those approaches. Our approach happens to be direct intervention. Right, and I'm here to say, because I was assigned this side of the debate, that the use of <laughs> The imperial nature what, police. What's this imperial thing? What, what, I'm not, I'm it's not, imperialist. Not. It is the idea that people, I don't know how many times I can say, people go around the globe, they are empowered by a UN I charter that does power. not specify how they defend nature. I'm empowered by three things, the three laws but, but, of ecology, the, 40, the law of diversity, the law of interdependence, and the law countries. of finite resources. You That's don't get to, look, you're a reality TV star, man. You don't get to control how your image is going to be disseminated and consumed by the rest of the world. That's what you did when you agreed with these bastards. What <laughs> bastards did I agree with? I, whoever films you, but don't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? Are you Nature? aware that are, they have no control over us? They don't tell us what to do. No, I know that. I'm just, say, I'm just saying that once you put your image out there and you talk about the types of things that you did in that first speech, that the law doesn't work, that we need to take the law into our own hands and that we need to become... The law what? might not work, but we can make it work. That's what we do, is we try to make it work. Yep. And, it and my work. argument is and we just that defeated, the way that you do that is wrong. We just defeated the entire Japanese whaling fleet and the Japanese government after 10 years. That was it.
are not as important as the species, because the species, as Captain Watson has explained, are what keeps the ecosystems afloat, which is the reason we have other generations that are able to live with you here today. Extinction means that infinite of those generations never get to see the day of life. Hundreds and thousands of people will never see the world as a result of our greed, our consumption, and not taking any action to prevent it. If there's a 1% chance that we can make things better than that, it makes more, it's far more important than anything else we can do, because we cannot say that the value of our life is more important than the potential lives that they would have. The opposition is 100% correct that the state is far from perfect, but to see the power we do have to change it, to exploit for the sake of being able to justify our threat action campaigns, to do that would be for, to forsake the strongest tool we could possibly use in the fight for environmental destruction, and for that reason, I proudly affirm. The fight is the fight that we have the privilege to fight, and it's a fine line, but we will walk it well. Thank you. Uh, we're going to count down to catastrophe. Says who? Says we're going to have an environmental ecological catastrophe. Yeah, global warming, other of the oceans means that these ecosystems no longer exist. And then How is it that this system, which is so uh, keenly aware of the environmental <coughs> catastrophes that loom on the horizon, is not willing to do anything about it? Well, that's very, uh, it has to do with the economic incentives that we said before. People don't just act because of what would affect their future generations. They're greedy, they're short And how does, they how, how, and how does activism in the vein of the proposition change that? Well, we put, first of all, we're enforcing the laws that are already on the books. Ideals that okay, the state but, agrees with. But, but money's more that. important. They refuse to act on those laws, but they are the laws. Because we money's more action. important. The state views that, but we can put pressure on them and you, you, do the action. Whoa, 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 whoa. You can put pressure on the state to devalue money and revalue the environment? We can put pressure on the state to take small actions that could make change or legitimate the actions that we take to be able to save these actions. Who embraces nihilism in this room? And I you can't talk about my own personal life then. No, I, I understand. No. <laughs> I, I think that the opposition strategy is somewhat nihilistic. Why? It, it believes that there is no true knowledge. That no I, I knowledge didn't say that at all. I mean, you said that there's no I said knowledge, that there no are multiple <laughs> perspectives on the world, and because we don't have unmediated access to reality, we should gather multiple perspectives in order to make better decisions. And I think that's How's that nihilistic? Well, if the argument is that we can one day know that knowledge through the multiplicity of other cultures, then I think no, that's we, No, we can come to a place where we make decisions. Okay, right? certainly. If so that's, that's not, not, we can just dismiss this nihilism. If that is the strategy, then okay. I think it's... What is it's, walk it's, away from the ballot box? To walk away from things like voting. Who, but who's doing that? I mean, if you embrace anarchy, I'm pretty no, sure... No, we embrace an anarchist vision for <laughs> activism, grassroots collaboration, etc. And I think all those and, things and, are compatible with what we are advocating. I agree! They are completely compatible. And this debate is about which should be the preferred avenue. Yes, and we think the preferred avenue I know. is the most powerful one. Though. Absolutely. Well, I know, I know you do. Say. But how does that mean that we walk away from the law or the government? Well, I mean, these are just examples of why using the state would be good and why it should be a But we're not saying you can never use the state, right? Certainly. I think that you must agree with a lot of what we're saying. Because the debate is not about state, not state. It's about state is the preferred well, avenue for I, protection of animal rights and the ecosystem. I understand. As it has the largest range and the largest ability to influence people, it should be a preferred method because no other action would have nearly as much of an impact. Okay. Uh, last thing. On the Nazis. <laughs> Wasn't Hitler elected Democratically? I mean, again, we're not defending all state government. I get I that, that, but your, your charge, no, 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 your charge to me was that non-intervention is what caused National Socialism. Wasn't it democracy? There was a bad state that another state should have done, taken action to overthrow, which is what we should have done. Awesome. Thank you. Curtis. 
The first time I saw you, I noticed immediately that your tones were brown but not sepia, and there were no herds of headless buffalo dotting the landscape behind you, no questionable blanket mantled across your shoulders, no sun perpetually set on the faces of plateaus, keeping themselves proud from the authenticity that you were not a dagorotype, a tin type, a stereotype, a blood type, I plus. Perception is marked by the yardstick of a photographer nearly convincing us a century ago we were ghosts trapped in the snapping shutter who was unaware we could learn where the F stopped and how the light metered out the ways we knew ourselves to be and not to be, no question. I think that the opponents have missed the fundamental claim made by Bill, which is that in order to win this debate, our opponents must defend that recourse through the law is the preferred method of activism. If we can demonstrate that the law should be the last avenue to justify our actions whenever we try to do activism, then we win. We also win for our criticism of global ecological police in our defenses of anarcho-indigenism, which is best described by writer Tayaki Alfred as a rejection of alliances with legalized systems of oppression non-participation in the institutions that structure the colonial relationship, and a belief in bringing about change through direct action, physical resistance, and confrontations with state power. I think one of the most important examples to this that uh, is when the captain indicates that they fly, this, they fly the flag of these peoples, that they are in discussion with them, and that they actually know what they're talking about. However, our argument is that the fundamental assumptions and orientation that the Sea Shepherd State makes it problematic for them to have a true engagement with these indigenous groups. That simply picketing the elite peoples in that group and saying, we have worked with them, that is good, is the same colonial justification that allows us to say it's okay that Manhattan was bought for six beads because two people that ran the tribes there said this is okay. This is not logical. This is not technical. This is simply a, a move to try to avoid responsibility for the fact that Inuit people have lived with these sea, uh, with these, uh, with these sea lions. They lived with these narwhals for thousands of years. That they are, have a relationship with them, a connection that we do not really understand as people that come from a different culture. So what we need to do is we need to allow that to be the fundamental starting point for our uh, activism. That is what Bill is talking about when he says we need localized criticisms to understand the importance that these things play for them. That the fact that the fact that you wave a flag does not mean that you can tell every single person within that tribe how to exist culturally, how to exist within this world. They say there's a countdown to extinction. However, I think this is exactly what Vine Deloria is talking about when he indicts this, this linear thinking. I think that uh, the captain sounded very pretty when he was discussing the ecological impact of seals going away, that certain fish levels would go down or up. However, I think it's kind of linear and simplistic to indicate that an entire ecosystem is linchpinned on seals and that fish levels are only impacted because there was a hundred less seals this year than not. I think there are a lot more fish, a lot more animals and a lot more things that go into this than simply saying, oh yes, there are a little, there are a few less seals, so that automatically means that the Inuit peoples should not be allowed to have any seal hunt, even though they do it within small means and have preservation threat protections given by the law, which we believe is to be good. He said they work on behalf of the whales, however, we indicate that this is not truly understanding what it means to work on behalf of people. How can you we have a species focus, but always miss out on the fact that just genocide is always around the corner when we believe that we can simply tell people around the world how to act. They make an argument about meat eating. However, we say, what is better to, uh, to allow low levels of meat eating in order for people to be able to exist at all, or to justify genocide in a global attack to make people become vegans? We are vegans ourselves. Well, come from a privileged place where we can afford to do this, that we have positions that allow us to do this. However, there are certain societies, especially indigenous ones, that have lived with the land for thousands of years, lived with these marine animals for thousands of years. Their beliefs should be in accordance. They say authority through the law is good. However, we say cultural imperialism is worse and will only perpetuate it through. And a few arguments about the law, which I don't think are answered. First, the law simply doesn't work. It is predicated off of false knowledge systems. That's what Vine Deloria is talking about. These linear notions that simply preserving 20 seals each year is going to magically save the universe. I think we have a lot bigger issues like consumptive practices. Next is that it's racist and genocidal, that it can justify things that we have indicated. Third is that it risks the violence that I was talking about before. And next is that conquest will always simply fail, that stopping 20 Senegalese sea lions from being killed is not going to save the environment. We should try and move in a, uh, try and create a movement that will allow us to justify new motions, new ideas, and specific and localized understandings in order for us to be able to make broad-based activism possible.
possible. Individual examples of success are not indicative of the movement. The captain has done many incredible things, and I will simply not deny that thing. However, this is not to indicate that the Sea Shepherds will be a success or always conti will continue to be such. We need to understand the important implications behind how we justify our actions before we can understand what the implications truly will be. Thank you. to bring justice to the whales? Uh, we think that there, that forms of activism should always start from an anarcho indigenous perspective, so we should understand the localized histories of the places that we are in. So for example, when the uh, Sea Shepherds of Senegal go in, they should talk with the indigenous peoples of Senegal. So once we talk to them, what kind of actions can we take? What range of actions? They should be actions that are in line with their cosmological perspectives, with their traditions, with their beliefs with their different insights that exist external to saying, yes, we have talked to a single elite that has said that we are justified. But how does that strategy avoid that issue? Because it seems to me if you talk to several people from that area, those several people could also be bought off, bought off in the same way that an official could. Well, like, I think the fact that there are lots of different uh, indigenous groups that have levied charges against the Sea Shepherds should indicate that if there have been uh, discussions with those groups, it has been insufficient in order for it to be able to be described as successful. So I think that it needs to go further than it can do within the notions of the law. Certainly. How long should we have that discussion with them before we decide to take action? At what point have we decided that I we have think, I think, you're, I think you're making up false lines as if like, okay, if we spend three years with the natives, then we'll actually be able to understand them. No, it's about being open to their ideas and their concepts and their alternative sure, how long, beliefs. Like, do not simply how say, long? we see a seal dying, so automatically we must stop that act, as if all deaths are not like something that are inherent to life, but also something that are important to different cultures, different beliefs, or important to their survival. That literally, uh, more, many more people will die because they were not able to eat one seal. I understand that. Be able to use those, like, the butter in order to survive. But it, see, it seems like that kind of logic would mean that we would take some amount of time. I mean, certainly, more time than perhaps I don't understand this time argument, then, then our activism needs to be more well thought out before we act. I don't think simply jumping the gun and saying, we're going to go extinct now, so let's just go around everywhere we can. This actually kind of feeds our argument and makes it sound like y'all are the imperial police. All right, so I'm actually a little um, curious about this. So if we get that perspective, like where do we go from there? What do we do with that? Are we allowed to engage the state? directly after we've heard their voices? I, I don't know. I think that the, that strictly allowing ourselves to use the cover of the law, I think the captain made it very clear that the, the use of the law is strategic, that it's not like they believe, like, I don't think the Sea Shepherds believe inherently in the law as a practice, but rather use it as a cover in order to be able to justify whatever the hell they want to do. So we believe you that, may, so uh, like, fidelity the law is probably something not even from this. Thank you. You make an argument about how there's a choice between genocide and meat eating. Who says that as a result of us thinking we should stop factory farms, that we would penalize with death uh, anybody? I think there's a huge them. difference between factory farms, which we will obviously never defend because that's foobard. But more importantly, the the we are talking about what do Inuit people uh, like killing a, a seal have to do with oil corporations? What does that have to do with BP? What does that have to do with any of these? oligarchs that are supposed to be running these capitalistic industries. These are specific groups of indigenous peoples that are trying to just survive. Thank you. Despite the fact that they haven't spoken, uh, I'm going to speak. It's crazy to me in a debate, but here it goes. Etched by Joan Devaya Kane, an Inupiaq poet. Her family was dispossessed of her home. Her entire village was, was abandoned as a result of the pressure of the United States federal government and its termination and relocation. She writes, wavelessly against flatland, the ocean, the sun shining. He carved the light, though the world remains. Unmoved wind furls. Sashes of dry snow across the road, poor electrical transformers. I was cochlear, curving bone. Handed me the eardrum of a bowhead whale, vain and furrowed. Listening, I began to know so little. Look, the clock.
claim that was made originally by me was not addressed by the, by the uh, proposition team. First, they have to prove that it's the preferred option. Second, they don't have access to reality in a way that they can either determine what successes or failures have happened or to predict the consequences of future actions. Success on that level is insufficient to prove that the preferred route for activism in the world should be to go to the law first, which is what the, they are de uh, defending. Look, if they have the right to authorize an imperial police force to protect nature, where the protection of nature is ambiguous, then their second speaker, Brandon, argues in favor of using that police force to enforce life decisions like whether or not you should eat meat, whether or not the production of that meat is in accordance with his or their ethics. This is what we're talking about. A police force of this nature could so be swept up in its mission. Forty countries, countless movements going on all across the world under the tutelage perhaps of someone who appears responsible but not guaranteeing that the law is the preferred route. Look, we're not saying you shouldn't stop the killing of whales. We're not saying you shouldn't stop the clubbing of baby seals. The debate turns on the question if they have, def if they have defended sufficiently the preferred option of the law. I would say imbue activism in the individual and go to the law as a last resort. Thanks. Well, the opposition certainly is passionate, but I respectfully have no idea what Sea Shepherd is all about. I mean, we're not out there fighting uh, native culture. There's not a single native person who is employed or involved with a commercial seal hunt in Canada. Not one. You know why? Because the Canadians or the Newfoundlanders destroyed the Bayatak people of Newfoundland. There's not a single one of them left, left, left alive. So what Canada does is confuse the northern Inuit people with this commercial operation, which is nothing but a glorified welfare project by the Canadian government. And why do they want to kill seals? Because they believe the seals are the, the, the reason that the fish populations are plummeting. This is all over the world. We blame the seals or the whales for the fact that we've wiped out the fish. Now, quite frankly, I don't really give a damn what people think about what we do because our clients are whales and seals and dolphins. We can go on about, we can go on about all this imperial crap. I don't even know what that means. Imperialism means I certainly don't have any imperial power. I'm fighting the man all the time. You know, Jesus Christ, they keep throwing me into jail and everything else and finding me and everything. We're bucking the system, but we're bucking it strategically in that we can throw the law back in their face and that we're not puppets to the law, we're simply using the law strategically. And there's a big, big difference in that. So if the law works in the court, we'll pursue them in the court. And if we can enforce the laws on the seas, we'll do that. We're going up against the Japanese whaling fleet. That's not some indigenous culture. That's, you talk about imperial, that's the imperial Japanese government. You know, we're not going up against, uh, you know, poor uh, fishermen on the Senegal. We're working with the rangers to go after Russian trawlers. You know, the reason that there is piracy in Somalia is because the real pirates went in there, that is, the, uh, the European and Asian fishing fleets, and plundered that coast, driving those people into impoverishment, forcing them into piracy. And unless we do what we're doing right now, the same thing will happen in Mauritania, Senegal, Liberia, and that is why we're yet there, to try and help those people. We're not going against any Senegalese, you know. When we bust a Russian trawler, that's a 250-foot mechanized factory vessel that has no right to be there. And we have every right to intervene and work with the people who have that power to do so to enable them to enforce the law against what is essentially criminal operations. Thanks. So we'll now open up uh, it to question and answers for people who are interested in directing questions to either the sides in regards to the debate. If you have questions specific for uh, Paul Watson or specific about the Sea Shepherd, things like that, that'll be the questions that we'll take after his speech. So these questions are uh, more specific to the debate that you saw and you can ask to either side. And all you have to do is just, you know, 
come up and uh, ask your question. <coughs> Would anybody like to ask the first question? <laughs> I'll be the guinea pig. Okay. So I have to confess, actually, that the uh, either four terms of the debate don't really grab me. Uh, but since that's the rule, I'll, uh, I'll abide. Um, I guess my question is how each of you would counsel somebody who is out here or out there and thinking about some injustice, not necessarily this one, any injustice. What practically do you do when you're making an ethical decision on how to act? I appreciated what uh, Captain Shepard said about uh, groups that might not give proper reflection, shall we say, on the consequences of a particular tactic versus what you might accomplish with that tactic. So I guess that's my question. What, what do you think differently each of you are counseling in terms of how people should respond to an ethical dilemma in a local place where they are right now uh, and weigh what is to be done? Well, what I would say on that is that uh, you know, we're all different and we pursue things in different ways. So therefore, you have to ask yourself, where can I contribute? Whether I be in the field of education or legislation or, uh, or a, 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 that's where you have to look at your abilities. Things are changed because of the passion and, individual, and, and imagination of individuals. And uh, so we all can't do the same thing. And that's really where this movement is so great. That is the environmental movement, the conservation movement, the animal rights movement, because it's a movement of diversity. And it's that diversity that makes a difference. Uh, a lot of us just simply have to agree to disagree and do what we do best, guided by our, our hearts. And uh, I set up Sea Shepherd as an organization to bring in volunteers from around the world to understand that they can make a difference, that the impossible can become the possible. By uh, inspiration, in fact, it goes back many years ago to 1972. I wrote an article about uh, a man who was in prison, and uh, I couldn't get that article published anywhere because uh, the man was a terrorist. And uh, the very idea in 1972 that Nelson Mandela would one day become president of South Africa was unthinkable, unimaginable, and impossible. And yet, it happened. So that is the inspiration that I have. The impossible can become possible. We just have to have the passion in order to you know, go forward and do everything we can to make it possible. And it's amazing how many things can actually happen that are positive as a result. I'd just like to say in answer to that question, I think the problem with recourse to the law is that we take responsibility that should be inside of ourselves and we place it outside of ourselves. I think that's the reason why, for example, people don't operate uh, in a large measure due to an ethical framework. They argue as if the ethical framework, morality or whatever, has been handed to them. By abdicating this responsibility, by taking it from the individual and putting it in the law, you encourage the individual not to develop an ethical perspective, the creativity and the imagination that is necessary to do the laudable stuff that was just talked about. Rather. You teach them, if they don't get caught, then they're not guilty. By abdicating responsibility the way that a legal reformist perspective would do, you run the risk of obviating the ethical work that we all do every day and make it impossible for them to build that ethical framework of environmental activism or really anything else. First time I've looked back and I see that there are a lot of people in the room that have come to see a, an outstanding debate. I can't imagine what it's like to go up against the Japanese whaling fleet, but I think I have an idea of what it's like because I'm watching these guys go up against these guys. It's difficult and it's, uh, I applaud all of you for, the, uh, for defending and advancing the resolution before you. Does not leadership make a difference? You've brought up a couple of references to the Nazis. I find that difficult in 
this discussion. I don't think it's pertinent. I think it's on a different scale. You brought up a couple of issues about being inside the law and walking a very fine line as to where that is. I think it has an awful lot to do with leadership. If you're going to bring up the Nazis and Bush, you're going to have to bring up the leadership within organizations that are able to discern and have the respect of the situation. And I'd like to hear from both sides, please, to the relevance of specific leadership in the movements and whether or not that makes a difference, whether or not you can believe in the law and respect it, or whether you have to step outside of the law and act in a different way, in a different manner. Thank you. Yeah, look, I think hierarchical calls to leadership, to direct a movement, to get people to act in the way that they're supposed to do, to be able to avert the calamities, perhaps not so significant as national socialism, but as monumental as the style of violence that we do to one another every day, I think that when you call for, I think, and, and we'd have to talk about it more, but leadership in this country is not about the Bushes and the Cheneys or the Paul Watsons and whomever else is running the movements, because the movements need to be imbued with the spirit of individuality, the creativity and imagination that is necessary, and without that, I, I don't see how it's possible that a leader can push people in a particular direction. What happens is a movement gains its institutional momentum and leaders are then generated from that. I think you have it backwards. I think it is the focus on the individual, trying to imbue them with responsibility, uh, in, encourage them to develop an ethical framework, and then good leaders will emerge. But look, you cannot be the leader of a movement that operates in 40 countries and expect to have any control other than through a titular head. Actually, leadership within Sea Shepherd is uh, rather unique, and that is that uh, crew members, they go back to their countries. In this last campaign, we had uh, 24 crew, uh, 20, or we had 100 crew from 24 different countries. They go back, and those people who have the initiative to head up campaigns, to organize campaigns, are the ones who lead it. Sea Shepherd doesn't have one leader. I'm not a leader. I'm founder. Uh, it depends where you are. If you're in France, and it's Lamia Salami. She, she's the one who organizes the Senegalese campaign. If it's uh, in uh, Australia, then it's uh, Jet Hansen, who's organized the Shark campaign. I don't give them approval. I don't give them disapproval. I don't even, in fact, in many of these campaigns, I hear about it in the news. Because uh, what I've been trying to do over the last 40 years is to instill an idea that people have the power to make the difference and, and that use your initiative, use your imagination, and go out there and do something. I don't give orders to anybody. I simply uh, am the founder of a movement, and that movement is free and un unrestricted. And just finally, one other thing to say, just on summing up the law, there's only three laws that I really uh, adhere to, the three laws of ecology. The law of diversity, that the strength of an ecosystem is dependent upon diversity within it. The law of interdependence, that all of those species are interdependent with each other. The law of finite resources, that there's a limit to growth and a limit to resources, and therefore we can move on. Our growing populations are stealing the carrying capacity of other species, forcing them into extinction. Into extinction. And what that results in is the breakdown of the law of, of uh, interdependence. I said a few years ago that worms were more important than people. Everybody got very upset about it. Why did I say it? Because worms are more important than people. Because worms can live here without us. We can't live without them. We need the trees. They're more important than we are. Fish are more important than we are. We need them. They're the crew that run the spaceship Earth. We're just passengers having a good time entertaining ourselves. And what are we doing? Killing off the crew. That is ecological insanity. two-part question. Um, if the law would be that you mentioned uh, the proposition side, um, you mentioned that there's laws exist where that if you, if you tape the slaughter of an animal, um, that you can be considered a terrorist. And I've looked into that and there's some truth to that. But if, if laws are shaped that way, 
then how can it be possible that the law would be the best way, uh, the, the value of law would be the best way to reaching a consensus when it comes to environmental con conversation and animal rights? If the law is the foundation of this country, so flawed in the way, and in the way as Professor Shanahan brought up with the complete, when the Supreme Court ruled that the Native Americans under the Marshall Court were allowed the land that they were living, and Andrew Jackson blatantly ignored that decision, which led to the eventual trail of tears and to the death of thousands of ind indigenous people to, of this country. How can we use that foundation in law as a way to fight it if the law is in itself is as corrupt as can be? Thank you. has to do with whether or not we think we have agency over the, whether or not we think we have agency over the law in any way. Sure, I don't think we have a lot of it, but I think there are ways to be able to influence the state through multiple campaigns or otherwise pressure. I think direct action is a good strategy to be able to uh, influence those people who would be able to influence these things. The Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act is one example of a law that has made it harder for activism to happen if we could were to overthrow said law, then we'd be able to better uh, promote our activism. So I think that it's important to recognize that, that law is the framework for how activism can happen. Activism can only happen to some extent within the law, because otherwise there are repercussions. If you don't do anything to address that law in order to have some form of negative state action, those actions will always be criminalized, and you will no longer be able to report, like he said, a cow. And it's really outrageous. I learned about this year. I cannot believe can go to prison, you'd be charged with terrorism for anything that's even perceived as a threat to animal, the animal industry. So if you have a protest outside of Walmart, they could theoretically uh, use that law against you, which is why there's been a chilling effect as a result of it. If we can't do anything about that law, if we just try to ignore that law, it's going to clamp down on us and we will not be able to uh, work outside of it. Uh, Abigail Watson to speak possibly a little bit about veganism. I understand, uh, I believe uh, your crews uh, are are vegan and, and you guys all eat vegan. Uh, and, and, to, and to also pick up on, on that last thought of, uh, you know, the new, the new red is green. Uh, and, uh, and thank you, Captain Watson. as a marine conservation society had to decide, uh, you know, just what was the cause of these problems. And when you, you know, first of all, we're not gonna eat fish because we're overfishing the oceans. There's just simply not enough fish in the oceans to continue to feed the ever-expanding population of humanity. So what's that gotta do with eating hamburgers? Well, it has a lot to do with it because 40 to 45% of all of the fish taken out of the ocean is fed to chickens, pigs, domestic uh, salmon, uh, and huscats, and amongst other animals. So we're literally eating the sea when you eat a hammer. Uh, right now we're living in a world where domestic house cats are eating more fish than all the world's seals put together. That chickens are eating more fish than all the world's albatrosses and puffins put together and pigs are eating more seals than sharks. That is a very bizarre and unnatural uh, way to live. And yet, so we're literally eating the oceans alive. And the bottom line, or the really, our very foundation of everything we do is based on this one thing. If the oceans die, we die. We don't live on this planet with the dead ocean, and the oceans are dying. And we need to stop this incredible exploitation of life without any uh, really understanding of what it, what those uh, the relationships between all those species are. About. And as to the question of the, the green is the new red, yes, uh, environmental groups, uh, uh, conservation organizations, animal rights groups are on the top of the FBI's list of extremist organizations above Al-Qaeda, and yet, you know, not a single person has ever been killed by any member of any of those groups. But in the last 10 years, according to a study that was released and reported in the New York Times only two weeks ago, 908 environmentalists have been murdered. Uh, most of them in Brazil, 550 of them in Brazil. And most of those environmentalists were, you know, people who were trying to stop the destruction of the rainforests, indigenous peoples. Uh, you never hear about them because that's not news, you know, some logger or a drip netter who sprains his finger because of a protest, it's the front page in the newspaper, you know, but murder an environmentalist, it's not news. Shouldn't have been there, shouldn't have got in the way. So the media is very much slanted uh, against us because the media, of course, is controlled by the same people who control everything. So 
But when we say we operate within the law, we don't, we're not slaves to it. We're simply trying to use it in such a way that we can strategically make a difference and it's still, at the same time survive. Because if we step over that line, especially a person in my position, they will kill us. And that has been proven time and time again. And the statistics over the last 10 years alone, the 908 environmentalists who were murdered to speak to that. Hi. Um, I just disagree with the opposition's assertion that you must directly mold a person's ethics in order for them to develop an ethical framework. I believe that when you involve a person, any individual in these issues, when you give them knowledge, when you just engage them in some way or another, that ethical framework will come naturally. So what do you think about that? I, I didn't say that you have to enforce or do something to create it. I said we need to invite people to produce their own ethical framework. So I agree completely. It is in contact with others, not just human others, that we formulate our views of the world. Those views of the world, if they are, have to first go through the law to decide what is acceptable to do to nature or not acceptable to do to nature, foregoes that invitation to form your ethics as yourself and the influence that have obviously nurtured you. It denies that. It denies the, the very authority, the autonomy that you're describing to fulfill an ethical requirement. I agree. We must not force legal, moral, or other forms of ethics on them. Yeah, I agree. Hello. My question is for Bill and Trevor, but more Trevor, because he hasn't spoken much in the Q&A. Um, I've asked him three times. <laughs> uh, so given that we would probably agree the state exists and is rather powerful, would it not be preferable to use the most powerful means to combat the very ineffective, genocidal, and racist ideology that you promote? Uh, sure. So uh, I think the first issue is that uh, we might disagree on the power question. Uh, if you believe what a lot of indigenous scholars do, that the United States is foundationally a genocidal society and that the law, even in its best interest, like this gets back to the Bondalorian discussion we were having, that trying to uh, invite different conceptions of the world into one very linear framework will always produce the same bad stuff that preceded it. So uh, the example that he gives is of generic housing initiatives, that uh, there was, it was seen that there was a lot of, uh, not a lot of housing, not a lot of housing for people, a lot of homelessness on reservations. So they passed generic housing initiatives, but they violated cultures so violently that even more people ended up homeless as a result of the, of the program. So, uh, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about specificity that these peoples can create their own work and values and power within themselves. That even direct action does not, like, the, the power of the sea shepherds should probably pay, uh, like, tribute to the fact that direct action itself is incredibly powerful. That you do not need the law to tell yourself that, dire that directly attacking the systems that produce the violence against you can be a successful thing. Uh, and I think there's a lot of empirical examples of indigenous fights uh, for rights and other processes out external to the United States that have proved uh, that to be the case. Hello, uh, quick question for the opposition. Uh, I was just wondering, like, why was the decision made to put poetry in your speeches? Uh, specifically, like, you know, in a debate, you know, you don't have that much time, it's very structured, so why kind of did you think that that was important to the discussion or, you know, to like talk about and present? I gotta say, it was a tactical decision that worked against ourselves because it ate up valuable speaking time. The reason we did it is because we believe that there are many different perspectives that can help us to inform, help to inform us 
about what to do in the world, particularly with respect to activism. Uh, aesthetics and an aesthetic rendering of the problem, in this case, let's say whales or conservation of precious ecosystems, is best accomplished if we can take an approach that recognizes that logic and reason and rationality and scientific knowledge are not the be all and end all that produce a livable world. Rather, different approaches, using novels, using poetry, using popular culture, using any number of aesthetic interpretations or renderings of the world allow our interpretations to be changed. We gave aside valuable speech time also because we think part of our white privilege as settler colonialists requires us in a forum like this to speak to that privilege. Okay. Uh, I have a question for uh, whoever wants to answer it. It's more about veganism and access to veganism. Because veganism, because of the expenses, because of how much it costs, what would you suggest people who live in communities who only have access to things like, uh, like uh, McDonald's, etc., who can't afford veganism, what would you suggest we do to sort of shift that paradigm or uh, suggest that, would you force them to become vegan or how is it that you deal with that? I wouldn't force anybody to do anything. Uh, we try to lead by example on the uh, Sea Shepherd, and if we people who come on board our crew who are not vegan or vegetarian are, have to uh, have a vegan diet while they're on board, and let many of them keep that vegan diet after they leave. So I don't believe in proselytizing. I think that we should uh, just lead by example. But you know, sure, I mean, McDonald's hamburger. I mean, a McDonald's hamburger takes 600 barrels of water to produce. One hamburger, 600 barrels. So, in other words, we're just simply subsidizing that. But the, um, I think that people just really should look at how they can lighten their impact upon the planet. Okay, uh, 30 years ago, nobody even knew what the word vegan was, you know, unless you're from the planet of data or something. You know, and, that, and then, uh, you know, vegetarianism was, was a radical thing, and now veganism. And, uh, but also, we have to look at the, the effect that even growing vegetables has, and the, and the, the runoffs that are, getting commit, are, are resulting in uh, dead zones in our ocean. The real population really, would, uh, the real problem when you get down to it is out of control human population. In 1972, I attended the UN Conference on the Environment in Stockholm, Sweden. The number one issue on the agenda was what are we gonna do about human population? 20 years later, I attended the UN Conference on the Environment in Rio de Janeiro, and it wasn't even on the agenda anymore. It just simply had gone away. In the meantime, another billion people had been added to the planet, and now another billion people since then. Every 20 years, it's been a billion people. It's getting more and more. At some point, this whole damn thing is gonna crash. There simply is not enough resources. It's a law of finite resources. How many species can we eliminate before we run out of the species which allow us to survive through interdependence. So we have to find a solution to that. I'd just like to add to that just real quickly, uh, and no need for applause, but uh, as a, a vegan for 27 years, the thing that I've found uh, most inviting is to try to adapt the reasons for what you're doing to the audience that you're trying to convince. I think that we have to engage in all sorts of initiatives in order to eliminate the food deserts that the questioner asked about. I think that in order to do that, though, we can't just say, OK, every city needs an urban garden. Because as we know, the urban garden movement has gone two different directions, one of them incredibly, no pun intended, fruitful, and the other uh, resulting in a lot of damage to the communities. The idea is, just like all the other advocacy from the, I would say decades, what are we? Opposition, uh, is you have to attend to the local knowledge base and accomplish whatever it is that you're trying to do by recognizing that people are individuals, they're part of communities, they're part of families, and that the only way for you to reach them is to affect your message in a way that attends to their specificity. I agree wholeheartedly with that. I think that another thing
interesting to understand uh, also, though, is that oftentimes the state makes it hard to make those decisions because of the subsidies that are currently out there for low-rate corn. The amount of subsidies that go to farmers to create the corn that is used for feed for cattle is so astronomical, which is part of the reason why a McDonald's burger is less expensive than uh, a healthy uh, plant-based alternative. So while I recognize that you know we should have some nuance in our strategy, not force everybody to adopt a vegan diet, I think a lot of people can if they have the information to recognize that maybe it is more accessible than they thought. But furthermore, in a world where the state's not just going to go away, we need to engage with the state to try to eliminate policies like the ones they currently have that make it such that meat is so expensive that makes it such a hard lifestyle choice in the first place. So this question is more directed towards the opposition. If you believe there's a sizable issue in a specific area, and after speaking to the indigenous people, which you say um, is the preferred avenue of action, and the natives have no desire to um, change whatever this hypothetical practice is, where do you move from there? Like, Do you respect their cultural beliefs and kind of take a hands-off policy, or do you take another avenue of action? I'm just wondering, like, what what is your plan? Yeah, I mean, uh, I want to say that uh, though we focused on indigenous peoples, uh, we're also saying that there are a lot of local knowledge bases that need to be tapped. We're not trying to give authority over to the indigenous peoples. We're not saying that the indigenous peoples can rule the rest of the world. Uh, what we're suggesting, however, is that if you gather a bunch of these different perspectives on the world, because our, I don't think anybody would deny this, and I certainly don't think it's nihilist, though I am. Uh, We have imperfect access to the world. Oftentimes our, our, our predictions about consequences go awry. Frequently, even the best controlled in, uh, experiment in a laboratory produces uh, results that are not only not anticipated, but go against all the other results that have been accumulated. So we wouldn't say, oh, well, you get the final word on this. What we would say as individuals is to try to incorporate that knowledge to weigh the reasons why that particular indigenous peoples did not think it was a good idea, but also to bring in all the other concerns, including those from people who are as committed and devoted as many of the people in the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society. In other words, it's not enough to rely simply on one perspective, whether it's the law or the indigenous. Rather, we need to develop multiple perspectives in order to get a perspectival approach and hopefully make better decisions. All right, so we're gonna wrap up the question and answer period for this phase. If you still have other questions, after uh, Kevin Paul Watson gives his speech, there'll be another question and answer period. And if you had pre-submitted questions, you'll be up first in order to be able to ask, uh, ask them. Um, I'd like to thank all of our participants for a great debate uh, concerning this topic, and I hope that you all really enjoyed uh, coming out to hear that. And without further ado, here comes Paul Watson for his final speech.